Animal lovers consider their pets a part of the family, so when the dog develops cancer or the cat gets arthritis, they don't think twice about seeking treatment. And that doesn't just mean Fido will be around longer. It can also lead to medical breakthroughs that benefit humans. WGBH News reporter Ibi Caputo shows us how. So here's his aorta. This is his left atrium. Cooper is a 10-year-old yellow lab, and Dr. Kirsten Rudrick is giving him his second ultrasound in six months. The pressure inside this chamber um, will increase, and that chamber gets larger and larger. The bigger it gets, the closer they are to heart failure. Cooper has heart disease, and Rudrick tells his owner, Chuck Doobie, that he can take his best friend on daily walks, but no strenuous activity and Cooper needs to take his medication. He's on Lasix, Enalapril, and he's on Carvedilol. Those are medicines that a human with a similar heart condition would recognize. I never knew it was, it was so similar to some of the, the human heart diseases that you hear about, and to actually hear that he was on some human meds, <laughs> if you want to call them that, um, to, to treat the, the heart, it was kind of interesting. While Cooper is benefiting from treatments developed for human patients, Doctors at Tufts are also looking at how veterinary breakthroughs can benefit human medicine. Veterinary physician Andrew Hoffman says the heart condition that plagues Cooper offers researchers a unique opportunity. This is a great opportunity to develop cell therapies in an area that's got received much less or little or no attention in human medicine. Hoffman studies how stem cell therapies might help animals suffering from chronic diseases like arthritis and kidney failure with a focus on specific treatments that might benefit pets and humans. We pick the type of disease problems that have analogies to a human condition. They're not exactly the same, but they're very similar. And we explore uh, you know, novel therapies in those patients. Hoffman is careful to point out that these pets are not lab animals, which are specifically bred for research. These are the patients that we see every single day with incurable diseases or, you know, diseases that are not uh, treated satisfactorily by standard of care. And if a new therapy improves the pet's outcome, it just might help human patients, too. Ibi Caputo, WGBH News. My next guest runs clinical trials on cancer treatments for pets. Dr. Christine Burgess is a veterinary oncologist. Welcome to Greater Boston. Good Thank to you. have you, Christine. Thank you. So can you think of an example where you were treating an animal for cancer or something else where you, you knew there was a direct beneficial correlation to human beings? Oh, for sure. There's actually a number of examples. Historically, um, I don't think a lot of people are aware that the first bone marrow transplantation was done in a dog, and a dog with lymphoma, it was done successfully, and that's sort of what really? catapulted it into humans. Um, a lot other, of dogs get lymphoma, by the way. They do. They? It's, yeah. it's probably one of the most common cancers that I see and I treat. Um, fortunately, we treat similarly like they do in people with uh, chemotherapy protocols. Dogs do very well with it. It's a very successful form of treatment. And uh, what I think is most important that people should know is although the drugs are the same, um, if the successes can be similar, the treatment is much less extreme. Mm -hmm. Our goal is quality of life for our patients, and we usually are able to achieve that. But and back to your question, um, some of the other treatments that we've been able to successfully do in the dog that's informed disease in people, since the diseases are so similar, um, is a drug called MTP that was evaluated in dogs with osteosarcoma, which is a very similar, biologically similar mm -hmm. cancer that people get, and children in particular. And this drug showed efficacy in dogs, and they then used it in a clinical trial in children mm -hmm. and found it had equally successful uh, outcomes. So we, we have a little bit of video of a cat undergoing um, chemotherapy. Actually, the video um, that you have available is a cat receiving radiation therapy. Oh, radiation. Yeah. Um, and the the all those it, tubes, it looks like chemo. Exactly. No, he's, he's actually he's under anesthesia. He has a tube in his throat oh. to maintain his airway. And, um, but the chemotherapy treatments that we use for something that we think would hopefully be used in people with similar cancers is that the clinical trials we do are very similar to what they do in people where mm -hmm. dogs are studied closely. Owners are aware that their dog's in a study. We have informed consent. And um, we are monitoring them just as closely as they would do if you or I were in a clinical trial. So tell me why this is more beneficial than intentionally giving a lab animal, which is horrible, but that's what we do. We give mm -hmm. them cancer, or heart disease, whatever, mm -hmm. met rats all the way up, unfortunately, to chimpanzees. But why is it more valuable when you're treating them, 
you know, as an everyday pet as opposed to an animal that you intentionally give something to? Great question. If you, if you think about it, if you really think about it, it really doesn't make sense that we use the lab animal rodent model historically to study cancer and cancer treatments. It's a fake environment. These are mice that are specifically bred to study certain diseases. It's not, it's not real. It's artificial. But our companion animals, dogs and cats, primarily, they, they live in our environment. Mm. They eat the same sure. food. They drink our water. And um, they have the same physiology. They have the same immune system. It's all more real. It's more applicable. So using our companion animals to help inform disease and uh, treatments in people, it's a natural fit. And you know, honestly, I should say, too, that uh, we use humans, and we use the developments that occur in human medicine for informing our treatment in our pets. So it's dogs helping humans, humans helping mm -hmm. dogs. Plus, when you have an emotional attachment to a creature, yeah. you have a more vested out interest in the outcome. That's right. That's right. Yeah, uh, most of our, our, our clients, our pet owners, are very, very committed. You know, they, they're, their pet is part of their family. Yeah, so, I mean... Uh, I'm a dog person, so you know I'm one of those ones who would probably do anything. But I mean, are there limits? Do you do, do you give people parameters or whatever they want to do? Yeah, no, I, I think that it's we're we're part of people's team. I always say we're part of your family once we start treating your pet for cancer. It's a scary, yeah. it's a scary world. It's scary when it's yourself. It's scary when it's your child, and it's just as scary when it's your pet, a loved family member. Um, so yeah, we're there with people. We're there to say, you know what? I think we're we're getting to a point that we need to consider stopping, mm -hmm. or you know, we're kind of right there all along. We we've done it. That's new to that person, and we're, it's really about the pet, not mm -hmm. about the it's just the person. way you would do it with a human. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right, Christine Burgess, thanks so much for joining us.